Welcome to the Dr. Gundry podcast. Well, it seems like every year more and more patients come to my office with full-blown food allergies. It is not my imagination either. Since the year 2000, the rate of food allergy in the global population has nearly doubled in the last 20 years. And in the U.S., it's estimated that as many as 26 million adults and at least 5 million children may have an allergy to peanuts, shellfish, dairy, or other foods. Well, according to my guest today, there is something that you can do about it. Dr. Kari Nadeau is the director of the Sean N. Parker Center for Allergy and Asthma Research at Stanford University and one of the world's leading experts on food allergies. Along with her co-author Sloan Barnett, she's written a brand new book, called The End of Food Allergy, the first program to prevent and reverse a 21st century epidemic. So on today's episode, Dr. Nadeau and I are going to bust some food allergy myths, talk about the best way to prevent your child from suffering from food allergies, and discuss how to get rid of food allergies for good. So Kari, it's so great to have you on the podcast and nice to meet you. Thank you so much for inviting me here, Dr. Gundry. It's wonderful to talk together. So let's start with the origins of food allergies. One one popular idea is something that I think a lot of people have heard about, the hygiene hypothesis. So um, what is that and what does the latest science say? That's a great question. So one of the items that we talk about in the book is just like you said, the epidemic of food allergy is upon us. It's been rising over the past 40 years. There are a lot of environmental cues that are increasing food allergy as well as allergies and asthma. These are not fun diseases to have. And one of the things that science showed us is that for people that were living on farms or were eating natural foods and that was really important to their diets and good microbiome, that those people were relatively protected against allergies and asthma. And with all of that knowledge over the past 20 years and as civilization has moved forward and as we have more systematic ways of putting preservatives in foods and having foods be tainted in a way that's not natural, that has increased the rate of allergies and food allergies in particular. So it's thought that the hygiene hypothesis is part of that whole idea of being good with quote unquote dirt, being in the farm, eating fresh and good vegetables and having really good diets that are healthy for ourselves. Because otherwise, if we're too clean as it were, then um, with too much disinfectants, too much detergents, that hygiene can actually create havoc on our gut sometimes and on our immune system, and that can lead to allergies. That's not to say that we shouldn't get vaccinated. That's not to say that we shouldn't avoid viruses. That's not the type of dirt I'm saying to uh, try to understand. What I'm talking about is back when my grandmother was a farmer, um, the type of lifestyle that people had to be able to be more uh, connected to the environment in a natural way was better. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska in you know, the post-World War II days, and we all had victory gardens um, that had been started you know, in World War II. And we would you know, go out to the garden and pull up a carrot and brush it off on our pants <laughs> exactly. and eat it. Exactly. <laughs> right? That's right? And, and I, when I was raising my kids in the, um, in the 80s, we had a victory garden and we did the exact same thing. Yeah, and, yeah. and then there was this movement that said, oh my gosh, you know, think of the germs that, you know, <laughs> you can't do that. You gotta triple scrub it and do a vegetable wash. And so did, did we get that all wrong? I mean, should we have learned from, you know, our grandparents and, and parents? Yeah, I think to some degree, as long as the earth that provided the nourishment for those wonderful vegetables and uh, materials that come out of the earth, as long as that earth isn't filled with pesticides or is safe, then yes, we should just take it out of the ground like you did and brush it off and 
have a little bit. We are. We need to make sure our planet is healthy, and we need to make sure we are healthy ourselves. But yes, we probably need a little bit more good microbiome. And we've done a lot of studies now to teach our immune system back to those natural ways. And it's all a balance. We don't want to have toxic things in the earth. We understand that. We don't want to have um, infections like what we call botulism. There are some things that we still need to worry about. But within the balance of understanding what the earth provides us and how to eat well and how to make sure that we have a little bit of good microbiome, that's helpful. We talk about in the book the interesting finding that if you grow up with a dog at home in the first year of life, that also protects you. So that connection, even though hopefully you don't get the dog if you're allergic to the dog, but if you do have the chance to have a dog in the first year of life, it seems to help protect you. And that's probably because the dog is bringing in dirt back and forth from the yard and you're living with that. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great point and something I often have emphasize on a lot of my podcasts. I actually write prescriptions for people to get a, get a dog. <laughs> And uh, it's, it's actually some of my most popular prescriptions, but I you're right. And I, and I talk about this uh, in, in all my books and in the upcoming energy paradox that dogs have huge benefits to your microbiome. And, and actually, yes. if you have an outdoor cat, uh, which I yes. used to have, uh, they, do, they do the same benefit uh, if they're outdoors. Absolutely. The more animals, the better, actually. I, I think and your books are wonderful in explaining that. There's a lot of benefits to being more outdoors, being one with nature, being able to talk to your doctor about, you know, what's good, what's bad, reading your books. Because uh, this hygiene hypothesis is important, but it's not to say that everyone who lives in a farm isn't going to get food allergy. There are some rare circumstances. So what we try to do in the book is to put some nice how-tos and give it as a tool set because we know enough now with the food allergy epidemic as to how to try to prevent it. And that's great that we have that knowledge in hand. So you, you talk about in the book, there's a connection between food allergy and the skin. So um, what's going on there? Yeah, sure, great question. So you know, our skin is beautiful. It protects us from the outside environment. And our skin, as you know, Dr. Gundry, lines the outside but it also lines the inside of our bodies, like the gut and the, the lungs, because anything that touches air is basically skin to our body. And so what we learned, and as well as many other people around the world, is that unfortunately now babies are born, and for example, babies born in London, 50% are born and get dry skin and eczema and cracked skin in the first three months of life. And what happens there is when that dry skin opens up, both in the lungs, in the gut, as well as outside to the air in our typical skin, that leads an opening, even if it's only can be seen under the microscope, and dust from the air, which typically includes allergens, food allergens too, and unfortunately that comes in, and you know all these molecules in the food, some of them are wonderful, but some of them, if Put into the wrong circumstance in the wrong environment, they can really increase inflammation. And so that's exactly what happens here. From the dust in the air, and people have shown this to be true, this is not just some hypothetical, there's so much science behind this. It gets into the skin and activates the allergic pathways that were meant in the old times to get rid of parasites. If parasites entered our lungs or gut or skin our body automatically started itching and creating redness and trying to push that parasite out and making tons of mucus so that it would just slip out. And unfortunately, now our bodies have a misfiring. And when that happens with dry skin, we have these bad allergies. And so it's really unfortunate. But what we talk about in the book is, well, how can we prevent that dry skin from happening in the first place? Using better detergents, using detergents that are healthy for the planet and they're healthy for you, using detergents that don't have a lot of chemicals and toxins in them will help decrease that dry skin. And then using natural lipids to replenish that skin is also really helpful to try to prevent allergies. You got any favorite natural lipids that uh, you recommend? Yeah, you know, this is a great question. Oftentimes, 
what's out there in the community. And there's a lot of skin products, as you and I know. And I'm sure that your audience has a really good grasp of all the different skin products. A lot of them are petroleum-based. A lot of them are wax-based. And these aren't necessarily natural. This is not what our skin typically needs. It needs natural lipids. And so people have studied what is naturally missing in people and children with eczema and dry skin. And um, it's ceramide. It's, uh, it's like these glycerols. And so there are these uh, manufactured lotions now. One is called Episeram. It's called a trilipid, and it gives back exactly what the skin is missing. So I'm hopeful that as we understand more about our science, we're going to understand more about all the amazing aspects of the skin and how to make sure it stays healthy. Well, I am always reminded that Sophia Loren said that the secret, her beauty secret was she not only drank olive oil, but she smeared olive oil on her skin. So uh, yes. what the heck? Uh, yeah, natural I'm going stuff. For- I, I'm going with olive oil. <laughs> exactly. Good. Good idea. Yeah. So uh, part of part of the hygiene hypothesis has been that our microbiome um, has a huge effect in educating our immune system, and even our microbiome probably has a huge effect on. If, for lack of a better word, eating some of our potential allergens for themselves. So what do you, th- what do you think, is, is, is our microbiome just decimated? Is there no hope? Um, what do we do about that? <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. You know, I love uh, reading the statistics that when we, as living organisms, we're 99% bacteria and 1% us, right? The living organisms that go around and travel with us every day, they're pretty much mostly bacteria. And, um, and so what we've learned is there are some really great bacteria that live with us that can really create, like you're saying, good gut health, good gut linings, provide uh, factors that protect the skin in our gut and even in our lung. And so... The question is, how do we make sure in our diet that we can get that, right? And we need to be careful, but there are a lot of data coming out with fermented foods and fiber and fresh vegetables. But the microbiome that we know to be helpful to fight against allergies or to try to mitigate and reduce allergies are uh, bacteroides species and, uh, and lactobacillus. And those are the two and some clostridial species that they found to be highly protective. So with that, you know, what do we do with that information now? Now I think we need to do some more uh, science and studies to understand what degree of that microbiome should help our guts. But I do agree with you. In general, we need to really understand how to eat better so that we can populate our living organism with living bacteria that help us synergistically. And unfortunately, a lot of people with the diets that they have now, that's not happening and it wreaks havoc. It causes problems and inflammation and immune system deterioration. So if people can get in the habit of reading your books, following some of your measures for good, healthy diets, I do believe that that will help in general preserve good microbiome. Well, thank you for saying that. The check's in the mail. Uh, Seriously, no. (laughs) Okay, so speaking of, of my recommendations, as, as my listeners know, I'm a huge fan of upping your vitamin D levels for health. So what does your research show about vitamin D status and allergies? Yeah, this is great, Dr. Gundry. We've talked about some of the reasons why food allergies are on the rise. You know, some people, they're doubling every 10 years. And uh, we talked about dirt. We talked about dry skin. We talked about dogs. And then there's two other Ds that need to be taken care of to be able to prevent allergies. And one of them, like you mentioned, is vitamin D. And our colleagues in Australia realized that for all of the wonderful prevention they're trying to do for skin cancer in Australia, they did slip, slap, slap. And so they put all the sunscreen on all the children in Australia early on. And that's great. But they noticed that the rate of allergies in Australia was going through the roof. It was almost 10% of all the kids. 
And uh, my colleague Katie Allen and her group did a lot of work on this and they studied 300 different factors. And the one factor that came out was the fact that the kids that had the higher likelihood of food allergy were those kids that had the lower vitamin D levels. So all that's to say is that science is behind what I'm going to mention now, which is if people can get better levels of vitamin D through different features, not necessarily to have to not wear sunscreen. We want people to wear sunscreen, but vitamin D matters. We know that vitamin D helps our immune system, but like anything, there has to be a balance. You can't go too much. You can't go too little. So to talk to people like you, Dr. Gundry and others, to make sure that there's equilibrium and that uh, we get good levels of vitamin D. And that comes with eating a good, healthy diet. Um, and that does help reduce allergies. Good to hear. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how uh, vitamin D does interact with our immune system. Um, there have been some very interesting studies on people with rheumatoid arthritis and yes. how their how their T cells behave. And their T cells, um, unlike other T cells and people who don't have rheumatoid arthritis, don't listen to vitamin D properly. Vitamin D often, you know, modulates the activity of T cells. And in people with rheumatoid arthritis, their T cells aren't modulated as well by vitamin D. And I noticed this early on in my experience with autoimmune patients. They, number one, frequently had low vitamin Ds, but it would take, to me, naively back then, a lot of vitamin D to calm their immune system down, more than I was even used to being comfortable yes. with. And, and then I got yes. aggressive with it and noticed that you know, the markers for rheumatoid arthritis plummeted. And I went, wow, uh, right. look at that. Yeah. Yes, so, no, you're absolutely right. It's important to look at all this. So what, what's, what's the fifth D in all these Ds? <laughs> the fifth D, which is probably the most important, is diversity of diet. And uh, unfortunately, some well-meaning people back in 2000 said to delay the introduction of peanuts and shrimp and, um, and tree nuts and uh, a lot of features that they were worried, not because of any other properties, but just because they could possibly uh, create food allergic reactions. And unfortunately, that was probably not a good guideline. Now the guidelines have turned on their head 180 degrees, and now the weight of evidence is huge around the US, around Europe, around all these different countries to say, if you actually start to diversify the diet, again, the way our grandmothers did, but on the farm or wherever they were when we were four to six months of age and trying to start to eat solids and infants are interested and curious in foods, to let them taste different things, natural, different proteins, have the immune system exposed to all those proteins at once, and the immune system will naturally like you said with the T-cells, those T-cells will naturally become ambassadors of tolerance, of good gut health and tolerance so that when those foods come in, our immune system sees them as natural. These are nutritious. So I don't need to fight against these. These shouldn't be allergic. But unfortunately, with a lot of um, the advent of commercial products for infant food, uh, a lot of these guidelines came out, and so people started using staged products. That increased sugar content for babies. It wasn't the best way to diversify that diet. So now we're going back to what our grandparents would probably say, well, of course, that's the way you should do it. Diversify the diet early and often and regularly. And what we're seeing in the studies of all these great work going around the world showing that diversity of diet is important to introduce different foods early is if you don't, that's the unfortunate part. The rate of rise of allergies is so huge in our society now due to probably a lot of environmental influences that if you don't, the rate of allergy is up to eight out of a uh, hundred infants. So we need to understand how we can stop that, diversify the diet, and do that regularly and often. And what we're showing right now is that that really does decrease the risk of food allergies, which is great. 
So that brings up another point. Um, what's, what's the role of genetics in all this? Let's suppose, you know, you, the, the mother, says, oh, you know, I, I'm allergic to peanuts, or my sister was allergic to peanuts, so I, my gosh, I certainly don't want to expose my son or daughter to peanuts because I'm allergic to them. Well, what say you? Yes, that's the sixth D, in fact, DNA. Where are we at there? We have done lots of studies on this as well. We know that about 65% of children and adults that have food allergy didn't have any allergies in their family. <clears throat> but families with allergies do tend to have a higher risk of having food allergies in their children. That is absolutely true. We're trying to understand the genetics. And there's also genetics to people that have more severe reactions. So we are really understanding this disease better. I, there's a lot of hope and promise that we want to deliver upon in the book, as well as based on science. And the genetics are very interesting. There seems to be certain trends in families. But on the whole, environment outweighs the genetics to some extent. But both play a very important role. But if you do have a family history of allergies and food allergy, that doesn't mean you can't do anything about it. It's not a fait accompli that by changing your diet, by helping your environment, that actually does mitigate the disease. So that's a good thing to know. Um, I oftentimes tell parents uh, that you shouldn't make yourself feel guilty, that um, it's not your fault. It's not what you ate in pregnancy. It's not what you did during breastfeeding that a lot of these things are happening from external things we can't control, but for that we can control, let's change behaviors to improve. So you brought up my next question. What about the expectant mothers, the breastfeeding mothers, this guilt trip that whatever they put in their mouth is going to inoculate their baby and put their baby on a lifelong allergy awfulness thing? No? Uh, uh, luckily... Uh, thank goodness, that does not seem to be the case. And initially, small little pockets of studies came out and that were really confusing. And, you know, science is messy, but the wonderful thing is that now we have thousands of data points from many individuals around the globe saying that what pregnant moms eat when they're pregnant, actually, it's better to have more healthy vegetables, less fast food, use things that have less detergent in them, very similar to what we're saying to try to help your baby, that can be used for pregnancy. But people do not need to avoid the food allergens that we typically say are food allergens when they're pregnant. In fact, it goes the other way. It's probably better to have them. And then in addition, same thing for breastfeeding. Even though just little bits of protein can get through to the baby when you eat it as a mom, that's actually good. So for the moms to also diversify their diet if they can, I know it's easy to say, harder to do uh, when you're busy out there, but that would it would be excellent to be able to provide that side of that sort of guidance for people. Great to know. Okay, now here's a question that often comes up, and I must say early in my restorative medicine career, I kind of equated the two, but I now think they're actually quite different. What What's the difference between a food sensitivity and a food allergy? Are they the same? Are they different? And how do you tell? Great question. We talk a lot about this in the book because my patients just probably like yours, Dr. Gundry, there's a lot of confusion out there in terms of what's a food sensitivity, what's a food allergy, how is that different from celiac disease? Um, there are now better diagnostics to differentiate these three things, and that's great. We are doing so much science, and hopefully, most importantly, is that will improve people's quality of life. That's what we're all about. So with that, the food sensitivities, I have a lot of patients that come in and say they'll eat certain chemicals or um, certain foods, and then it really causes bloating and headaches, and those are real. And that's quite disabling as well. Uh, we know that patients with wheat sensitivities, that's not fun either. Um, and so I oftentimes listen to them and their symptoms. And then I'll tell them, you know, unfortunately, we don't have a, a perfect way to treat that, but we should listen to what your body's telling you. 
And then we'll actually test, just like you mentioned with the T cells, we'll go in the lab and test whether or not those cells are, those types of foods are activating their T cells. And they typically are. In the very same way that the T cells are activated for like rheumatoid arthritis. And so that's very different. That's like an inflammatory reaction to those different foods. And they're not necessarily just proteins. They're different small molecules, they're carbohydrates, they're fats. On the other hand, food allergies are mostly to proteins. And there, the dose doesn't so much matter as much as just having it exposed, even on your skin, like we said, little bits that you might breathe in. There, people can react with this huge reaction, and that happens within two hours, typically. You have itching and mucus development, and that can lead to anaphylaxis, whereas food sensitivities typically don't. So those are the big differences. These, the food allergies, that comes with skin prick testing. That comes with what we call IgE testing. So that's why these two things are different. But we're trying to do a better job because there is a gray zone. And I want to be very compassionate to families and patients that are suffering from these diseases because we don't have all the answers yet. But patients are my inspiration, as I'm sure they are to you as well, Dr. Gundry. And that's what pushes us to try to do better. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, early on in our office, uh, we did do uh, skin allergy testing, needle prick testing, and IgE, food sensitivity testing. And uh, quite frankly, I became disenchantized with that. I can say I, I actually took allergy shots uh, as a teenager oh, and, a, and, and a young adult. In fact, yeah. Uh, I was at Yale and I had chronic sinusitis. I mean, I was always oh, sick. Sorry. And so they decided to do skin testing on me in the Yale clinic, I'll never forget. And I was sitting there and I said, gee, this is kind of a funny feeling. My, my throat is swelling up and oh, this is very interesting. And I was pre-med and I, I said, gee, you know, I think I'm going into anaphylactic shock. <laughs> And oh, seriously, just so then the nurse sorry. walked in and went, oh my gosh. And of course, <laughs> gave, gave me a shot of epinephrine. And I said, what was that? And she said, oh, sorry, we almost killed you. Um, <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's terrible. Yeah, the skin testing can have that associated with it. That's terrible. I'm so sorry. <laughs> we are learning about these reactions in a medical student and in college. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I'm sorry. But so anyhow, I, I'll tell you, as, as time has gone on, I, I use a series of tests, and you may know about them, actually from the Bay Area, Vibrant America is the company, and I don't have a relationship, but yeah. I, I started using their tests, which are horribly named, called Zoomers. And yeah. they, uh, their initial Zoomer was called a Wheat Zoomer, and it, look, it looks and still does for leaky gut, and looks yeah. for reaction to gluten and the gluten family. Uh, and then they went on and on, and then they developed a food sensitivity test based on IgG and IgA. Yeah. Yeah. And when I first started doing them, I really kind of poo-pooed them, because I, I hadn't been happy with Ig allergy tests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then as anecdote after anecdote came of people who took this information and eliminated them, I got more and more interested. And let me just tell you a quick new, recent story. I have a, a woman in her 50s who had horrible, massive psoriasis. She was on two immunosuppressant drugs, which really made her sick, and she clearly wanted off of them. And that's who usually ends up in my clinics. And so we actually got her off her drugs. Her psoriasis completely resolved following the Plant Paradox program, except for a two inch spot in the middle of her back. And a few months ago, we're sitting in my office and she says, you know, I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm really happy, you know, I'm on no drugs, my, my psoriasis is gone, but isn't yeah. it odd that I still have this two inch patch? And I said, yeah, you know, it is odd. I said, you know, I'll tell you what, would you mind if we do a food sensitivity test on you? And she said, you know, I said, it'll cost you 149 bucks. And she said, okay, so we do. And they usually get their results about two weeks before I see them back in the office or on the phone. And so in her food sensitivities was almond flour and mm -hmm. vanilla beans. And like so many of my patients, 
They're making lots of almond flour cookies and breads and crackers, and she used right. a lot of vanilla extract to, to flavor it. Ah. So she's sitting in the office, and, she, and we're going over the list, and she says, you know, I, I've seen the list. Two weeks ago, I took out almond flour and vanilla bean. Ah. And she said, here's the weird thing. That spot in two weeks now has shrunk down to an inch. Wow. And yeah, just by taking almond flour and vanilla extract out of her diet. And it's those kind of stories that exactly. really have, have made me, you know, this isn't pseudoscience anymore. That's and, right. and of course, yeah. you're on the leading edge of hopefully telling everybody this is not pseudoscience. Uh, exactly. And we need to take each of these cases and each of these patients and how they're doing and try to understand more. I'm so glad you're doing that because I, the one thing we talk about in the book is that it's, this book is for both adults and parents, that there are so many adults out there with food allergies and food sensitivities. And what we were surprised about when we learned that when we did this big questionnaire throughout the U.S., 50% of the adults that have food allergies now in the country, they were able to eat the foods no problem when they were little. And all of a sudden, something changes. And we, you and I, can probably understand that because the immune system is always developing. There are things that allow us to mature as we get wiser in age, our immune system can change a little bit. But I was surprised to see that so many adults uh, have allergies now. And um, about 10% of people who are adults in the US have doctors diagnosed with food allergies. So we need to get ahead of it, like you said, and pry this apart and really try to understand for each person what they need. I spend a lot of time in the book about the history of food allergy and how we can try to prevent it, but that one size doesn't fit all, that people are different. And so they need special personalized ways to help themselves. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Um, it's, uh, and even I, I treat uh, brothers with uh, fascinating skin autoimmune diseases, young kids, and one uh, will actually have uh, they'll have common sensitivities, but one will be far more sensitive. I'm thinking of two children in Texas who are 8 and 11, and the 11-year-old profoundly reacts to spinach um, with basically psoriasis. And wow. his 8-year-old his brother has just the worst, different dermatitis, but he doesn't react to spinach. Uh, and so they love to tease each other because, you know, one will be eating spinach and go, hey, don't you want a bite? And so, uh, yeah, it's totally different. And they, yeah. you're yeah. right. They have to be personalized. Yes, that's right. Which gets me to my next question. What's a prevention diet? Ah, well... It really depends on what you're trying to prevent, I think, for all of us. I, I do. <laughs> well, you're right. <laughs> uh, I, I think, like in your wonderful books, as well as your recommendations, that we need to really think about our diets carefully and thoughtfully. And with the same respect, what we've learned, to be able to decrease that risk of allergic reactions, to improve compliance, to make sure that someone doesn't develop allergies, whether or not they're infant or an adult. Uh, my oldest patient that developed a food allergy was 99. She developed a shrimp allergy like when she was 99. She wanted to get rid of it, so we gave her immunotherapy. But all this is to say that how do we prevent, how do we decrease the risk of food allergies and improve our gut health and our health overall? I think that by training our immune system with the diversity of proteins early, I think that really helps. So that's what we talk about in the book is these are natural, these are food proteins. They don't have to be done in high amounts, uh, just a little bit every day and doing it simultaneously so that our, our immune system sees all these food, food proteins at once. It drives the body to become tolerant and that's great. So that's at least in our hands now with lots of data to suggest that that would be the diet to do at any age. Okay, you mentioned immunotherapy. Now, many people hear that word and they think of every commercial they see on TV of an immunosuppressant drug, which I, of course, used and pioneered in heart transplant, but that's not what you're talking about, I hope. 
<laughs> that's right, documentary. And you know, poor, I, I feel badly that you had to go through these draconian procedures of allergy shots. Those are not fun. You can see that lots of what we do as allergists, skin prick testing and allergy shots, we want to try to forego those. Let's get rid of them. Let's do better. And the reason we wrote the book this year is because for the first time in our history, we have an FDA-approved drug. Yay. And that's really important because uh, palforzia, which uh, is a peanut uh, immunotherapy, was approved by the FDA last year for food allergy. But at least we have the tools by which to teach us that immunotherapy here is not immunosuppression. It is natural. It's building up your immune system. It's building up your immune muscle very slowly, very carefully, because you're giving back the same thing someone's allergic to, and you're modifying and building up those T cells and other immune cells to say, okay, this is natural. This is something I don't need to be so uh, allergic against. And so over time, after a year or so, people then change their thresholds so that they can eat that item. And for people with dairy allergies, other allergies, it's really great for them because they don't have to worry about accidental ingestion, but it's not easy. And so we talk about this immunotherapy and then it's a wonderful start to the end of food allergy, but we're really at the beginning. There's so much more we have to do to make it safer and to make sure that people can comply and use it to their advantage. Uh, but it is a different type of immunotherapy that people typically talk about. Uh, but we would not do shots for foods um, ever. It's really that probably oral or sublingual or skin. Those items will probably help a lot. So do you think there's going to be, you know, a, a pill for a milk allergy, a pill for an egg allergy? Uh, is that where you're going or can somebody do this at home? Yeah, you can't do this at home. You need to do it with a very uh, clinically skilled staff that knows how to deal with food allergy. Most food allergies are still out there, and any therapy that's used for them is, should be seen as experimental. So if you are interested in immunotherapy and treatment, please look on clinicaltrials.gov. We provide that resource in the book because clinical trials are where it's at in terms of really improving people's outcome and trying to make something safer. So for multiple food allergies, for milk, we don't have a milk pill yet. We don't have a pill for these other nuts, um, as well as shrimp or fish, which most of the planet is more allergic to, uh, and egg. So with that, it is coming. There are companies um, like Aladapt and Igenex that we talk about that do have products there's uh, companies like Novartis and Genentech that are putting things through now to try to make allergy therapy safer. So I think that that is coming, Dr. Gundry. I think that we have a lot of hope and promise based on that, and it'll probably come very soon um, in the next few years. So I'm excited about that, but we don't have those pills yet. But like we were saying, personalized medicine is going to be key here, that not one person fits a, a particular box. And so we need to make sure that whatever we use fits that person's needs and their goals. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited that uh, we are going to be able to retrain the immune system. I, I gave a paper at the American Heart Association Lifestyle and Epidemiology meeting in Phoenix uh, this, this year, uh, okay. looking at people with, um, with celiac disease. And we looked at their Ig. G and IgA responsiveness to um, wheat proteins, including gluten and the non-gluten proteins. And over a year period uh, in this report, nine out of 10 patients following our program uh, not only had no longer celiac, they no longer had leaky gut, but nine wow. out of 10 of them, none of them had any IgG or IgA memory of gluten or wheat proteins. Wow. They, yeah. Now, I'm not saying that you can go back and eat wheat. I'm not saying that. But right. I'm actually more than mildly encouraged that we have it within our capability to retrain our immune system. Yes. Um, and I bet you you would say the same thing. 
completely agree. I am always humbled by the immune system and what it can do, the power when it, when it misfires, but also the strength that it provides us as we try to retrain it. And I think that we've been talking a lot about infants and babies today, but I want to make sure that your audience knows that this retraining can happen at any age and that we need to really focus and talk to people like yourself and others to get the right recipe to retrain each of our immune systems and tweak them so that they are improved, especially in this era where we are living with COVID, we are trying to understand this disease, how can we avoid it? But if we do get it, how can we help our nutrition to better train our immune system? Oh, I think you're so true. I think this is really, if we learn anything from COVID is that this is a clarion call that we have to arm ourselves and our immune yes. system. And, yeah. uh, you know, pre-existing conditions basically, in my humble opinion, says, you know, you've got diabetes or pre-diabetes or leaky gut and your immune system stinks and, uh, and it's on fire all the time. Yes. And, you know, and people who have a great gut and are eating properly, certainly in my patient population, we just have not seen people... Yeah develop COVID or if they get it, it's like, oh yeah, I had it, but I didn't yeah. even know it. You know, I, they, they found it on a test, but I didn't know I had it. Um, exactly. I agree. There's all these other factors and where it's definitely exposing that um, important aspect of our immune system and our guts and our health. Well, it was great having you on the show and uh, it's, I mean, this is really an exciting area, and I, I really want people to pick up this book, The End of Food Allergy, and because there is absolute, not only hope, but there are things that people can do and do today rather than yes. kind of living with this and living in fear. That's um, so where do, where, do, where do people find your book? That's probably pretty obvious. Uh, but where do they yeah. learn more about your book uh, oh, that's and your great. work? So, yeah, no, I really appreciate it. So uh, thanks for holding it up. I'll hold it up too. We'll be co comrades uh, at the end of Food Allergy. It's on Amazon. It's on Kindle. It's on Audible. Uh, I think you can Google it. We have a great website that's very interactive. We want feedback. You know, like anything, this is what we know right now. It gives a nice how-to to what to do for your family or what to do for someone that might have food allergy and you don't have food allergy. And it's all for all ages. But importantly is um, we, this is not something that's just going to stay as a book. We want to have interaction on the website as well. We want feedback. So we really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today, Dr. Gundry. And I hope your audience will also give us feedback and like the book a lot. And what's the website? Uh, the website is The End of Food Allergy. Oh, well, that's duh. Okay. <laughs> oh, it's great. Thanks for asking. It's not, All right. it's well, not always obvious. It's great. Right. Thanks, Dr. Gundry. Really appreciate it. I hope you are well and stay safe and healthy. Uh, I, I intend to. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll get together again, I hope, and great talking about this with you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Have okay. a great Friday. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Okay, it's time for our audience question. Jennifer Beringer on YouTube asks, Can fasting eat up the bad lectins that go rogue from leaky gut, especially the ones like WGA, that dock in cell ports and refuse to move? Also, are there other ways to remove these permanently docked lectins? Hey, that's actually a really good question. First of all, uh, eliminating these lectins is kind of number one rule. If you don't eat them, they're not going to get into you. And you brought up WGA, wheat germ agglutinin, uh, which is actually one of the sneakiest lectins there is. There, we know now that wheat germ agglutinin can get through a normal gut wall. It doesn't have to be leaky. It's a very tiny protein. And we also know that wheat germ agglutinin does bind to docking ports for insulin, but there's some, been some recent research that shows that WGA sticks to a sugar molecule, 
on the inside of your blood vessels called sialic acid, which is also on the inside of your joints, and it's also in the space between your nerves. So getting rid of WGA is actually pretty doggone easy. Just do not eat whole grain products, particular wheat, rye, and barley. And oh, by the way, there is a lectin in oats that mimics wheat. And I recently had a patient, actually this week, whose autoimmune attack on his blood vessels, which had been quiescent, we measure this, went through the roof. And when we went through what he was eating, he had started eating pressure cooked oats on a daily basis for breakfast. And he didn't read on our little slip of paper that we give them that you cannot pressure cook oats because you can't break that lectin with pressure cooking in oats, wheat, rye, or barley. And it was, I mean, one of the best, you know, wake up calls for him that I don't make this stuff up. Uh, this is reported in the literature and I'm reporting it to you that these things are nasty and cause you to attack your joints, attack your blood vessels, and attack, attack your brain and nerves. So, a great question. So you don't need to fast to make this stop. Just eliminating things like whole grains makes a big, big difference. And yes, your cells are constantly turning over. They're constantly being remade you turn over 90% of your cells every three months. So when that cell changes, all those docking ports are changed. So just keep eating and keep eating the right way. Great question. Time for the review of the week. This week's review comes from Maestron74 on iTunes, who left us a five-star review and wrote, thank you so much for the effort and great information you give every podcast. I enjoy every episode. All the data is so interesting and educational. Well, thanks Maestrom74 for leaving us a, a review. You know, it helps me and us make sure we're reaching the widest possible audience to share our message of good health through healthy eating. So keep those notes coming in and hopefully we'll read yours. And please leave a review wherever you get your podcasts because that's how we find out how we're doing and what you need to hear about. And as you probably noticed, a lot of our podcast episodes are devoted more and more to questions that you ask. And if enough of you ask a question, we'll do a podcast. All right, that's it for today. I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you.